Hi guys, welcome back to the frozen winter wonderland that is Denmark. Thankfully here inside of Athena it is nice and warm and I've already made a little bit of progress this week out in the forward cabin. I've primed and applied a single coat of paint to some of the areas in the washer dryer section and the freezer section. And I've done the same in all of the lockers above the V-berth. It is amazing how big of a difference a little bit of paint makes. These are all the tasks I need to complete before Athena is ready for my fiance Ava and I to move aboard and start cruising full time in 178 days. This week I am gonna install the new headliner in some of the forward cabin. I'm gonna install some lights in that and uh, well we might also put up a little bit of insulation on the underside of the deck. A little later in this video we're gonna install this AIS transponder from Garmin. It is the AIS 800. If you want to skip directly to this there are time codes down below. Hopefully when this somewhat anonymous looking box is hooked up we'll be able to pick up some of the other boats here in the marina and maybe even the ferry that's a little bit north of here. I was planning on getting everything at the base of the mast hooked up this week using these spiffy digital switching boxes from Seasone but I'm waiting for some electrical cables so that's gonna have to wait until next week. As a super quick teaser if you pay attention to this area right here you'll be able to see a little LED light up when I hit this switch here on the chart plotter. Just like that. And if I manipulate this physical switch here you'll be able to see it turn off again. Like that. On. Off. And you can also see the state of the circuit here on the chart plotter. It's gonna turn green right here in the top of the little switch. Just like that. On and off. I got a little course in programming CSON equipment yesterday. Thank you Simon. It was super interesting. What you've seen here is very much a bare bone version of what we can do. We can do a lot more really cool stuff but uh, we'll get back to some of that next week. For now it is back to the forward cabin and the headliner here above the V-berth. The first thing to do is to put up some supports for the new headliner. The height of those are going to be defined by how much insulation I want to add. Above the V-berth area where the camera is standing now I'm gonna add 19 millimeters of Armaflex, that's about this much, but where I'm standing right now is where we're gonna be walking and headroom is at a little bit of a premium. I am 6 foot 2, 189 centimeters and uh, well my head is touching the bottom of the deck. So back here I'm thinking about only adding 10 millimeters of Armaflex, but uh, we'll figure that out a little bit later. For now let's just deal with the area over the V-berth. I've got the old headliner and that makes life a lot easier because I can use this as a template. It should fit everywhere except for the old forward hatch because the new one is a lot bigger. A few years back when I rebuilt the entire deck which was needless to say a ton of work I decided to put in a much bigger forward hatch so that we could lower a washer or dryer down through the forward hatch if we ever wanted to. But the, the first step is going to be to get some new supports put up so we can see how well the old headliner fits. For the supports I'm gonna layer two pieces of 12 millimeter plywood that'll give me 24 millimeters the insulation is 19 millimeters, which needs a gap of around 5 millimeters, which is perfectly fine. I'm going to secure these with a few screws and just a dab of this stuff. This is cool tack. This is a cold weather construction adhesive. So yeah, these don't need to carry a lot of weight, but I don't want them to come falling down either. It looks a little bit shabby, but all the supports are now in place. Let's see how well the old headliner fits. Besides looking a little bit furry, this thing is a nice snug fit. Up there you can get a good idea of how much bigger the new hatch is. That is really the only modification I'm gonna have to make. The opening for the new hatch doesn't have to be precise. This is all gonna get covered up by a bit of trim so any hole will do as long as it's not too small. Last night I swung by the workshop and used the old headliner as a template to make the new headliner. I still have to sand the edges but after that we can go ahead and do a test fit. I used a jigsaw to cut out these pieces of plywood and that left a slightly wobbly edge. I'm just going to use this little bit of sandpaper and plywood to straighten it out.
that is one good looking headliner if I do say so myself. Up here there's maybe half a millimeter worth of a gap but other than that it is nice and tight. I'll pull down the new headliner and then we can start putting up some insulation. Making paper templates like this one overhead is kind of a pain in the behind because of gravity but with just a little bit of tape and patience it usually works out. I haven't removed the sticky backy stuff yet, so it's just a test fit, but that looks like a nice snug fit to me. Last week you saw me put up insulation in the inside of the clothing locker on the side of the hull. I did that to prevent condensation and also to help insulate a little bit. But when I'm putting it up on the underside of the deck, I am not worried about condensation because the deck is cored and that on its own is enough to prevent condensation, at least with the winters we have here in Denmark. I'm mentioning this because I think some of you will find it weird why I've gone through the trouble of sealing the plywood down here. This serves the exact same purpose as the plywood up here. Here I'm concerned about moisture, up here I'm not. And that's simply just because the hull is solid fiberglass whereas the deck is cored. I'm gonna hold off on insulating down here until I am done varnishing and painting. Ta-da! A fully insulated deck over the V-Birth. Let me put up the new headliner and then we can do something I've been looking forward to for a long time and that is to put up some lights. I'll install six of these lights over the V-Birth. It's the same type of light I've got here in the saloon and to do that I've got this hole saw which cuts a hole that's basically the absolute perfect size. And very importantly, the center drill here only protrudes out about a few millimeters. That is going to allow me to drill the holes with the headliner in place and also score the insulation at the same time. Putting up six of those lights here over the rebirth might seem like a lot, but these are all going to be dimmable using the magic of digital switching. I've got this long metal ruler with a hole at the end and it is basically perfect for running the wiring between the holes. I just run it in between the headliner and the insulation, secure the wires and pull it through. I've wired up all of the lights, so let's shove them in there and see if they work. For this little test, I am just going to connect the lights directly to the batteries. And then next week, we'll be able to get everything wired up nice and proper. Unless I mess something up, the light should be coming on now. Let me just turn off this ridiculously bright camera light. Oh, this looks Awesome. I am thoroughly pleased. Good morning, guys. It's been an entertaining morning. While I was refueling to be able to stay nice and warm here inside of the boat, some of the local firefighters started messing around out on the ice, cutting a big hole in it and jumping in. I heard one of them say that the ice is 10 centimeters or 4 inches thick. Like I mentioned in one of my previous videos, the ice doesn't really hurt the boats here inside of the marina. It just kind of sits there and does nothing. The only downside to the ice is that some of the pilings do get pulled out. Right now the water is at an all-time low in the marina, but over the next week when it starts coming back up, I'll see if I can find one of the pilings that are getting pulled out and pointed out to you guys. To finish the headliner section of the video, the way I decided where to place the lights was simply just center them over each of these openings and then put them about 22 centimeters away from the lockers that is half of the distance here so that's the way I came up with that. And we already have proof that the insulation is working. There's frost here and no frost back here. That's where the insulation stops. As you can see, I still have a lot more headliner to put up. I think I might put that up next week or most of it because I can't put up the last little bit until I've figured out the freezer section and I still don't really know when the freezer is going to show up. But let's move on to installing this little guy, the Garmin AIS 800 AIS Transponder. I believe this is one of the new-ish Class B Plus transponders. Last time I installed an AIS transponder, there were only two classes, A and B, but uh, we'll get back to the classes a little bit later on. Here's everything that was inside of the box. There's the transponder itself, NMA 2000 cable and a little T, 
power harness, a connection from the AIS transponder to the VHF radio, a little USB cable for programming the AIS transponder, and of course a manual. I'm sure the vast majority of you guys watching this video know what AIS is, but just in case you don't, the acronym stands for Automatic Identification System, and it's a super awesome way of knowing what's around you while at sea. It works over VHF, so there is no need for an internet connection or anything like that, and it will alert you if somebody is on a collision course with you, provided of course they also have an AIS transponder. Right now, this AIS transponder doesn't know that it belongs to Athena, and before it knows which boat it belongs to, it's not going to transmit your position, it's just going to be in listening mode. Now for us to be able to tell it which boat this belongs to, we need an MMSI number. This fine piece of laminated paper is Athena's ship station license. It contains her call signal and also her MMSI number. MMSI stands for Maritime Mobile Service Identity and it is a globally unique number. Meaning once I have input this number into the AIS transponder, Athena should be the only vessel in the world with that MMSI number. Let's get this little guy connected using the included USB cable. We've got a bunch of little LEDs lighting up here. That seems like a good sign. And here in the software, we now have a COM port 5 available. So let's try and connect to that. When entering the MMSI number, it is very common for AIS transponders to only give you one chance. If you mess up the number, then you might have to return your device to the manufacturer to have it reset. So let's pay close attention here. 28.59.01. You've got the option of inputting the position of the GPS antenna so that the AIS transponder can offset that for your position. Now Athena is a very small vessel and I don't know if the box is going to use its internal antenna for the GPS signal or if it's going to get it from the NMA2000 network which would be one of the chart plotters. So instead I'm just going to input the length of all and the beam. Let's uh, cross our fingers and see what happens when I hit save. Please check if the MMSI is okay. You cannot change the MMSI once it was programmed. Well, I have quadruple checked it, so let's just assume that it's okay. programming was successful. That takes care of the configuration. So now it is just a matter of running some cables and getting this thing installed in the clothing locker. Here I've got all of the cables I need to run from the nav station into the clothing locker. There's an ethernet cable, NMA2000 cable, coax cable, and of course some cables for the electrometricity. Last week I ran this bit of conduit here. This goes underneath the cabin sole, goes back here, and ends up in at the nav station. It's one of these three. I'm not entirely sure which one, but we'll find out in just a second. I will hook up the trusty vacuum to one end of the conduit. There might be a horrible sound now, so apologies for that, but I'll turn on the vacuum. Yep, that does sound pretty horrible, but at least now I know that this is the piece of conduit that I'm interested in. Here I've got a thin line with a piece of paper towel attached to it. I'm just going to suck that through so we have a mousing line. As if by magic, the little piece of paper towel is now in the clothing locker. I've tidied up the conduit. As you could see, it was way too long, but it's now all nice and tidy and secure. So let's get some stuff run through here. It is, and I kid you not, a few hours later. I ran all of the cables in here only to find out that I had gotten the NMA2000 cable the wrong way round. So then I had to rerun that, which turned out to be a right pain in the behind. Copious amounts of swearing and cursing later, I've now got all of the cables with the right ends at the right places and I've also mounted the AIS transponder. I've already connected the antenna and the connection to the VHF radio, so now I just need the power cable and the NMA2000 cable. The AIS transponder and the radar and most of the other stuff in here is going to be controlled by one of those digital switching boxes. So for now, let's just get it loosely connected and then we can tidy it up next week. Now I just need to connect the VHF radio to 12 volts and put a plug on this coax cable. It looks like the NMA2000 network and the VHF radio are basically going to be the only thing connected to the 
12 volt distribution panel. Everything else is 24 volts. I've got another video where I go into a little bit more detail about these connections here, but you can also find plenty of videos on YouTube about how to solder these. For now, I will power the AIS transponder directly off of the battery. So uh, let's get this connected see what happens. Well, so far so good. Seems like the power is working and apparently everything is working. AIS alarm, a dangerous target was detected. I wonder what that is. Turns out the dangerous target is right here inside of the marina. It is Gaia. That blue sailboat there at the very end of the pontoon, that is Gaia. If we go into AIS vessel, we can see all kinds of interesting things about Gaia. We can see her call sign, her MMSI number, her size, a whole bunch of stuff. And time to nearest approach. Well, I mean, I don't think this got the memo about the four inch thick ice. And if we zoom way out, we can see the little ferry that is about eight or nine nautical miles from here, or at least we could a second ago, it's up here. There's a diagnostic section in the configuration tool. I've reconnected the PC and there are no errors, no warnings. In the tool, we can also see the data being sent and the data being received and everything looks a-okay. I've just checked and we've also been picked up by marinetraffic.com. So all signs point to the AS transponder working. We can't really do a lot more testing until there are some other boats out there that we can kind of get to play with us a little bit. But uh, yeah, that's gonna have to wait until the ice is gone. I've spent a bit of time tidying up, getting ready for next week. But just to round off the AIS section of this video, I hope it was somewhat clear that it is a super useful tool. It's kind of difficult to demonstrate when we're frozen in place inside of the marina and there are basically no other boats around. Except good old Gaia, of course, but uh, yeah, we're both stationary, so it's kind of... Eh. A little earlier, I mentioned the new-ish class B plus AIS class. And uh, well, if you're gonna get an AIS transponder and you are a smaller vessel, so you're looking at the class B ones, there's absolutely no reason to get the old class B. You should definitely go for the class B plus. Now you get more out of it if you are on a vessel that moves very fast. But still, for a slow boat like Athena, it is a nice upgrade. For the old class B, I think the transmit power was two watts. And for the B plus, I think it's five watts. So the range should be better. And then if you are on a vessel that moves very fast, say above 14 knots, then the frequency at which you update your position gets bumped up a notch. And then if you move even faster, I think the next threshold is at 26, 12, 27 knots, something like that, then you get to update even faster. But for a vessel like Athena, we're never even gonna see the 14 knots, but still, having five watts worth of transmit power rather than two is pretty cool. There is one additional benefit to the class B plus, and that is that the old class B could become down prioritized if you were in a highly congested area. I believe the new class B plus is at the same level as class A in terms of priority, which of course is super important if you are in a highly congested area. We'll get back to the AIS stuff when the weather improves a little bit and I can take Athena out for a sail and see if we can find some other boats. Now, next week there is gonna be some digital switching stuff. Very excited about that. And of course, more work in the forward cabin. Tomorrow, I think I'm gonna get started putting up the headliner in this section over here. I can't really put up any headliner over here until I've got the freezer. But Tuesday, I think the varnish is gonna show up so I can start varnishing the trim that's here and also this bit here, which means after that is done, well, then I can start painting everything. Next week, it will be three weeks since I ordered the freezer. And the delivery time was, I believe, three to four weeks. So hopefully it'll show up soon, but uh, until then, I'm just gonna have to work around it. And that is gonna be the end of this week's video. I hope to see all of you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. And this week, I'd like to dedicate the see you at the end of the video to a very special five-year-old, Ramona, thank you so much for the beautiful birthday song. See you.